Yo, what's up, everybody? Growth Driven Agency, yet another episode coming at you from your fearless leader, me, Joey Gilkey, CEO of Sales Driven Agency. We're going to talk about agency shit, and I got a killer guest for you today. We got my man, Travis Bliffin, out of just south of Nashville, Tennessee, not too far from me. He runs Stellar SEO. Travis, I'm going to bring you up, man. Tell the people a little bit about who you are and uh, a little bit about Stellar, who you guys serve, and then I'm going to pepper you with some some good questions. We'll have a good conversation. All right. Hey, thanks for having me on and uh, definitely look forward to the questions. Um, <clears throat> the, the quick overview, uh, we're primarily a link building agency, and the only exception to that is in February of this year, we launched a new division end-to-end -end SEO for law firms. Um, seems to be a hot space right now. We decided to throw our, our uh our hat into the ring on that one as well. Nice. Um, that's the two big things we do though, primarily link building, direct to clients, also for other agencies. Um, been doing it since 2012. Um, got into the industry completely uh, by chance. Wasn't really a, a planned out thing. And so I, I imagine that's how a lot of people started. Um, but the reality is uh, I started an agency with no previous experience, uh, no money, no understanding of what to do. Kind of learned on the fly for the first several months, um, and then it, you know, it's progressed, and, and now here we are, nine years later, still at it. Uh, hopefully, we know a lot more now than we did when we started, but uh, that's kind of how we got into it. Love it, man. Yeah. So, talk to me a little about the the decision to kind of throw your hat in the ring, as you said, with the the law firm. So. Um, I, I've obviously I work with agencies full time. I work with mm -hmm. hundreds of agencies, and there are plenty who do SEO and they do it for law firms. Do you like a specific niche even within that niche, like a sub niche of like maybe it's personal injury attorneys or criminal defense, or is it we work with attorneys and we do end to end SEO for them? Yeah, so I mean, basically, we're going after a personal injury or mass tort, but also essentially only law firms in the top 200 cities in the U S. Okay. Uh, so we have a very specific goal. We build the division to bring on 100 clients from, you know, 100 of the 200 largest cities in the U S um, and work with one client from each one of those cities um, and, and really build a very dominant presence for them. Um, the reason why we decided to get into it is because um, we have a, a really well built out link building process and a content team in house already. Uh, most agencies, the biggest pain point they have is building links. Yeah. Um, you know, so they either try to build it themselves and they only have a few people and so they can't scale it, or they have to rely on third party vendors. And a lot of times that becomes its own mess um, in terms of you know timelines, deliverability, things like that. Um, so since we already had those two things, those are obviously going to be two hu huge parts of ranking in more competitive markets. So, you know, the, the technical side of things, um, that's kind of the, the missing piece that we're filling in right now with the, with the new division. Um, but we think that, that having the team that we do and the experience we do with the content and link building part of it, um, that will be able to, to compete really well, um, maybe even better so than a lot of other agencies, because once they get past the technical portion, um, we'll just have a lot more capability to produce links in, in higher volumes without sacrificing quality it's our in-house team so um you know there's essentially more cost efficiency in it um than if we're paying a vendor stuff like that so um <clears throat> that's kind of why we're getting into it because you know two-thirds of the puzzle we say there's three pillars to seo technical seo content and links two-thirds of those we have on lockdown the first one um you know, we're bringing on a couple of really talented people to, to master that process and then uh we'll rock and roll from there love it so I want to dive a little bit deeper into the agency in a minute, but I want to talk more about uh, old school you. So you've been doing this for a hot minute, all right? Uh, you also serve in the Army. Thank you so much for your service. Um, big troops fan over here. I'm in uh, East Tennessee, so we love our veterans. Um, talk to me about the journey a little bit. So who were you? Let's go way, way, way back. So I want to talk about like 12-year-old you. Mm -hmm. Like who were you? What were you into? What was kind of the... Were you a tinkerer? Did you think you'd run an SEO agency one day? I would imagine probably not. Who were you at 12? No. Nope. So uh, I'd say 12-year-old me or even 20-year-old me, neither one of those two had any clue that, that uh, <laughs> I would end up in this industry. So, uh, you know, 12-year-old me basically likes sports. 
like video games. Those are kind of my big hobbies. Um, <clears throat> you know, a little bit, a little bit back in time there. We're talking about in the '90s when that's 12 year old me. So a little bit different time, but uh, yeah, that was it. I mean, there was never, um, you know, never really an interest in technology. Uh, not so much an interest in in starting or owning a business. Like I, I hadn't really given any thought to any of those things, right? Um, something I guess the only thing really that probably carried through is is starting even then, right? Like even going back to grade school, uh, the first sport I played was wrestling, um, and it you nice. know well, wait, I well, like class because, you? uh, like the the heavyweight class, you? Uh, but I don't I don't know what that was at the time. And, it was and funny is it was, I'm a heavyweight now. I ended up blossoming towards the end of high school, and then I, I went and played division yeah. one football as a tight end. So I'm a bigger guy. I'm six three two fifty. Um, but back then when I was wrestling freshman year, I was the 161 pound yeah. class. So I, I grew on 90 pounds since then. <laughs> yeah. So that was, I mean, thankfully with like when you're in grade school, the heavyweight class is, is, uh, <clears throat> smaller, yeah. right. Or else it, it would be kind of worrisome. Um, but, but basically when I progressed into high school is it became the 215 weight class. Um, so it's like one or two below the, the top, but, um, <clears throat> essentially that was kind of the first sport that I did from there. I went on, I, I played football in high school. Um, and then graduated high school, joined the army shortly thereafter. Um, and so really the only thing that carried through that whole thing was stubbornness and, uh, competitive spirit. Um, so, in order to join the army, I actually had to lose a bunch of weight at the time mm. um, to get down to theirs because, you know, you've got to be like basically sub 200 pounds. Um, I, and I'm like six feet, six one, depending yeah. on, on who's making up the, the thing. Right. So um, had to go through that process. Um, and so anyway, stubborn, competitive, really nothing else. Went, joined the army, spent four and a half years in there, um, got close to the end, realized that I, I wasn't really going to uh, continue with that. And so I started, you know, looking at options. What can I do? Uh, actually moved back to Illinois, where I'm originally from, got a job for the Department of Corrections. Um, mm. wasn't, a, wasn't a bad gig. And so uh, they closed down a bunch of facilities uh, in the state. And so basically everybody's story is they closed down some facilities. I got laid off, blah, blah, blah. That didn't happen to me at all. I just got put on midnight shift and I hated it. <laughs> it's probably the worst thing ever. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to spend the rest of my life feeling like a zombie. So I'm going to figure something else out. So um, I started the very first thing that actually caught my interest was resume writing. I thought, oh, what the hell? I'll try a resume writing service. We'll give that a go. Um, and so I actually did that very first on uh, Upwork or I don't know if it's Upwork now, or I think it was Elance at the time, and now it's Upwork. Mm. Um, right. So I did that for a little while, and I'm like, well, this sucks. There's no recurring revenue model. Um, and, you know, people are pretty horrible on here. I don't, I don't love it. Um, <laughs> Upwork. <laughs> so I pick up a magazine on the way to work one day, and I'm, I'm thumbing through it, and it's like, here's the best industries to get into in, in 2013. Mm. And I said, okay, well, what's on there? And so SEO was on the list. And so I assure you that that's the very first time in my life that it ever crossed my mind that I might get into the SEO industry. How, how old are you and, uh, How old am I at this point? 2012, okay. so 28, nice. roughly 28. Okay. Um, so I read it on the list, see it. I am actually already have a profile set up on the Elant site. So I'm like, okay, blog writing is a big part of SEO at the time. Um, so I actually just switched over from writing resumes to writing blog posts. And that's how I kind of first got started. And that's even where I first ended up with my uh, SEO client, the very mm -hmm. first one I had, um, is I wrote blog posts for this tanning salon. They had two locations, right? St. Petersburg and Pinellas Park, Florida. And so this guy um, ordered blog posts from me a bunch of times. And then I eventually asked him, you know, what are you trying to do with this? And he told me, you know, Essentially, I've, I'm getting these blog posts because I'm trying to rank. And I said, well, there's actually some stuff that you're missing. Would you be interested in trying it out? And so for essentially what was the amount he paid for the blog posts, I got my first SEO client. Uh, and, and that's where it started. Uh, it. But yeah, up until then, really no, you know, it was just complete fluke. If I hadn't bought the magazine, I don't know what I would be doing now because that's literally where it came from on the okay. list. Looked like a good one. 
So talk about today. Where are you guys at? What um, We'll get into kind of some of the decisions you guys are making now to get to where you want to get to. But where, where are you guys at today, nine years later, right? Right, you've been doing this for nine years. So yep. do, you have a, do you have a partner as well? Nope. So no you? partner, but we have a, a team. Our team is we actually have 53 people. Awesome. Um, so we started at one and have built essentially up to 53 over the over the course of that time. Yep. Um, and actually have a few new people coming on this month that are starting with the law firm um, division. So it's growing and, and that will actually grow out a little bit more as well. Um, so quite a progression we made from where we started. And as you would imagine, uh, just as I had no previous experience with SEO, uh, I also had to learn in the first couple of years, business management, hiring people, <laughs> Still learning. like pretty much make this long list of stuff. I The best thing I ever learned is to hire people to do stuff for you that are really good at it. So accountants, yeah. right? HR stuff, you got to hire people because you cannot get bogged down by that stuff. Let's talk, let's uh, talk about that for it, a second. So yeah. I'm a huge fan of paying top dollar for talent. I think some people have the mindset, whether it's a scarcity mindset or it's just a, I'm always looking for a deal, you know, wheeling a deal and where for some reason we cheap out on talent. What for you, did you make the mistake of hiring cheap first and then realizing I can't keep fucking around with these, you know, dollar hourly rate trying to cut prices because it's costing me more on the back end. Like what was your journey to saying, you know what, I'm going to pay top dollar for people because I'm just like you, like I'm going to pay more than my market requires. And we have a totally dispersed team. So I have people in big markets, small markets, et cetera. I'm going to pay them more than they can find a job locally anywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, with the initial hires, we were actually in Illinois at the time. And so in that area, it jobs in general don't pay very well. And so we paid decent for the area. Um, and so I, I don't think our initial struggle was so much in, in the salary or the, the pay options that we gave. Um, it was more so in, in understanding how to properly vet the experience and the skills of those people to make sure that they would be a good fit. Mm -hmm. And so that's a big issue we ran into like the first couple of years is we would have um, a lot of turnover. And it's because people in spite of, you know, past experiences, all those things that they might have brought to the table, they were not able to be fit into the process that we wanted them to fit into. Um, and so that was that was really the struggle is we got the wrong talent um, in the beginning. And, and uh, just in this case, it, it didn't happen to be uh, monetary based, but um, <clears throat> you know, I can definitely relate to that. Now, fast forward to now, uh, Nashville has a really hot job market. Yeah, for sure. And so you really, you don't have any choice other than to offer good compensation and benefits if you're going to attract people in middle Tennessee. It's just because yeah, there's so many, the, you know, you got the, yeah. uh, the medical, you know, you got the big healthcare systems, but then you, you, you know, in Nashville also, there's a growing trend of the, you know, health tech scene, which is mm -hmm. they're going to pay top dollar. So you do have to yeah. kind of compete with that. Are all 53 of your current employees local? Are you guys dispersed? Outside of like August, so, if, if COVID has dispersed you or not, but or are they all in Nashville? So everybody was in Nashville up until last year, okay. right? So February when we first went remote, when everybody else did. Um, <clears throat> so we worked together at an office. And the reason why we, we hired everybody locally is because we could all come and work together. Yeah. Um, once we took that transition, went remote, we actually started scaling up our team a lot faster uh, at that point, just because we were ready to kind of step on the accelerator on some other projects. Um, and then we also started hiring people from outside of, of Tennessee. Um, and we even hired a team like data collection prospecting team in the Philippines mm -hmm. um, because, you know, you have to have that. And, and in addition to our primary team, uh, we do have a large prospecting team, data collection team. Um, <clears throat> just takes a lot of man hours to do some parts of what we yeah. do. And so... Now we, we basically have people dispersed throughout the United States and then another team within the Philippines that, that works on prospecting. And so, um, and then with our new hires, um, all of the new people we're bringing on board, we pretty much have it set to across the United States. But with that, we've had some applicants in for various roles that were, you know, Australia, Canada, Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it could become a matter where we end up with some international people on the team as well. Yeah. Um, Assuming that it's a good fit. 
Sure. So I want to go down that path. You said the the, the folks in the Philippines uh, for prospecting and data data collection, things of those na- that nature. How did you guys get so nine years later, fifty three employees? Um, I don't know what revenue equates to there, but usually it's a hundred thousand a head, give or take. But I won't even stab it. Once you get up to that higher number, that fluctuates quite a bit. Mm-hmm. But for you, how did you guys get to that point? Like, what was your methodology of growth? Was it fairly organic and referrals in your network? Was it just pounding the pavement, knocking on doors? You know, was it, you know, taking your own medicine and, and driving leads through SEO? Yeah. And so um, <clears throat> something that we've never successfully set up, and and this is, again, another, uh, the law firm SEO thing is, um, as a secondary thing of wanting to compete in that is, is my redemption shot at setting up an outbound sales process, right? <laughs> because I tried it before a few times yep. and it never worked. Like I couldn't get it right. And so I have it on a bucket list. Like I have to conquer this. It's driving me crazy. It's one of the things that I just haven't been able to do yet. Yep. And so as a result of that, and, and probably, you know, early on, a lack of knowledge, expertise in how to do it. Um, we really relied very heavily on SEO mm-hmm. and even on content marketing, going all the way back to 2013, 2014, guest posting on websites that would have a good audience. Mm-hmm. Um, Website Magazine, you know, five, six years ago had a, a, a high amount of traffic, a good amount of readership. Later, they sold it, and I think the traffic's kind of dropped off. Um, but in its heyday, it got, you know, a lot of traffic and they had a large email subscriber list. So we wrote a, a, a weekly column at website magazine that generated a lot of leads. Um, by the time they came to us as a lead, they had read a lot of our stuff. So they were pretty warmed up and it made the sales process pretty smooth. Um, referrals, they would refer other people to us. Um, and then rankings, you know, basically generating rankings for various, various keywords, various areas. Um, that's how we were able to actually grow our client base grow our revenue is by taking those steps. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's a probably outbound sales is a very complex process. At least in my mind, it's a complex process because there's a lot of moving parts. Um, ranking a page has a lot of moving parts too, but I know a lot more about ranking websites than yeah. I do about building sales teams. So and it's an easier route teams to build. and very little about ranking. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And yeah. that's it. So, you know, we played to our strengths to get to where we were and um, that's, that's how we did. And now, um, you know, fast forward to today, essentially we're at the point where I now have this list of things that I didn't accomplish initially that I want to go back and, and check off. One of those being an outbound sales team. The second reason is because I want to, to start a subsidiary company and hit the Inc. fastest growing company list um, within you know the first 36 months of existence. And so in order to do that, I believe an outbound sales team will be a critical part of that nice. equation. And it really is just because our original company, it didn't grow that fast, um, you know, because yeah. it started as a single person. Like you said, you're learning business yep. management, all those things. Yeah, exactly. Well, I've gotten 17 companies on Inc. 5,000, so uh, we can talk about that. Let's talk about sales because this is where I'm going to be straight to the point. You talked to my team. We did not win the deal, which is a a humble pie I have to eat. I want to talk about that. You ended up going a different direction, which is cool. Like We're all going to lose deals. Uh, I think you talked to JJ, if I recall. Um, You went in another direction. Let's talk about that. What what was your decision-making process for you're trying to build out outbound. You talk to my team. You talk to some other team. Maybe we got to you too late or whatever that nature is. I'm not afraid to talk about the elephant in the room because I think it's fun for people to listen to. What was your decision yeah. making process there? You know, what were some things that you were looking for that the other company brought that maybe ours didn't? Um, and then obviously I'm going to try to win your business back in the future because we're the best in the game. Arrogantly speaking. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, I, I got gotcha. you. <clears throat> so basically what, um, what led us to that? We talked to a lot of different people. And so basically the suite of the range of services that we looked at was from basic sales recruiting mm. all the way to a complete done for you um, outbound sales solution or process, which is my understanding of, of what your company did based on that conversation with JJ. Yep. And so where we settled was actually kind of right in the middle. So we didn't go with the, just the straight recruiting firm. We didn't go with the full. We went with a company that um, finds, vets, trains 
and then um, sets up a, a system, partial system, to implement and monitor. Um, they also provide training to whoever will be the sales supervisor at that point um, to help in setting expectations. And so we kind of fell into that middle group. Cool. Um, and and really the big reason that we did is because um, some of the things we feel fairly comfortable with already, um, you know, setting up a CRM. Totally. It, that, that one seems, you know, fairly straightforward. We've been using a CRM for uh, nine years now. It's actually... Uh, high rise. We started using it when it was with Basecamp, and so they they stopped updating it a couple of years ago, and we eventually mm. have to switch. But uh, I've kind of been putting that off uh, because I've grown to like high rise over the years. But right. you know, some parts of it where they had a little less emphasis, and that's that's where we felt like the emphasis was more on some of the areas that we felt we were weaker in, and so that's really what led to our decision in in trying to figure out, you know, which way do we go. And um, I also thought of it as kind of a progressive ladder. Um, if somebody in the middle does not successfully do what we need them to do, then we can always take a step up and figure out what we missed, yeah. what we added. And in that process, we will also probably learn what we did wrong at the time. Nice. And so that's what I thought of it as an opportunity. If it succeeds, if it works out perfectly, um, you know, we started in the right spot. If not, it gives us a, a clear path forward to figure out what we could improve and learn what went wrong with the process. Nice. Was it the person that they brought in? Was it something with the process? Was it something with the training? Um, yeah. Because if, if anything, um, I don't mind to, to lose money sometimes or, or waste money sometimes, as long as there's some valuable lesson that comes from it. Yeah. Um, One of my main you know, life principles is pain plus reflection equals progress. And as long as I'm progressing, I'll take the pain all day long because I know I'm going to reflect yep. on the pain, why I felt the pain. And then if I progress, then I'm winning. Yep. Yeah. And I'd say the the other part of that too is that it, um, you know, it, it kind of gives you that opportunity to see how much can I be involved in the mix and get it, you know, because it's kind of a bucket list item for me. Um, and I would probably have a different take. Like if we were in a scenario where we had to get this going so fast and, you know, the livelihood of our whole company was dependent upon this, um, it's a, it would be a different scenario. Um, you know, right now, if, if we just continued to sell link building, um, we would continue to grow. We have grown, um, you know, and it, it runs very smoothly. Love it. Um, and so it, it's an, a great opportunity to kind of learn, test it out, see if we can get it right. If not, we have a clear way to go forward. Yeah. Um, you know, that that's kind of how we ended up on the decision that we did. That's great. Uh, yeah, I'm obviously just busting your balls. I don't care all that much. <laughs> I think you should, yeah. you should make the decision best for you. I was just curious. Um, I think it's important as we all make decisions as agency owners on whatever the big decisions are, right? It's, it's making the decisions best for us in that particular moment. And on top of that, what I loved was that you're investing in solving the problem no matter what, whether it's with me or with someone else. I don't care. I think what I find is that most agencies are afraid to try to crack the code on outbound sales because it's so intimidating. It is more complex, right? I come from a vastly different background than most agency owners. Like you talked about, most agency owners do the, I worked for somebody or I did something else, didn't enjoy it, got into freelancing somehow, whether it was a side project or I just decided to try it that turn into one or two extra projects that turn into, oh, wow, I now want to do this full time. I've got a new project or a big retainer. I hire some people, boom, I'm an agency owner. Now I'm going to grow this thing. And it's like, where in there was I a sales person? Where in there did I learn sales management? Where did I learn how to hire, train and manage sales people, build outbound campaigns, blah, 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 right? And whereas my background was Fortune 100, built a team of 115 salespeople, VP of sales of this small business, VP of sales of this agency, start my own thing. That was an outsourced account-based sales agency. And now we're doing sales driven agency years later. Hmm. It's like, yeah, it would make sense that we're an outbound shop, right? But for you, it, it didn't necessarily make sense for a while. You, you stayed to your craft, but then eventually you said, once I want to hit predictable, sustainable, scalable growth, and I want to launch these things... I'm not going to be afraid to tackle the problem that's in front of me that that is kind of that big elephant. I know it's there. I know it's helpful. I just can't figure it out. So I kudos to you, man, for trying to solve yeah, the problem that was, that's on that big, that list of yours. Yep. That, that comes back to the stubborn part. I can't give up on it. It's just <laughs> one of those things where I, I just need to do it. Like, I don't know why, but I, I just got to check that box. Yep. Um, you know, and then I'll feel like, okay, I've I've now 
done everything I need to do. Yeah. But then I'll, I'll come up with something else I need to do. I mean, that's just the nature of, that's the nature of how it. I think about stuff, but, but that's how it'll go. So let me, let me throw a question at you though. I, I'm curious to get your input on this about this conversation. So, cool. and I imagine some other people think this too. So most of the people come to us now, they, they come through inbound mm -hmm. one Avenue or another. And so the average size of our clients is, is pretty high relative to all the averages in the industry. Um, you know, 10, 15, 20, $25,000 a month clients, they come to us. It's an easy process to sign them up because they already trust us because whatever they've done to find us. One of the biggest things that I always wonder with outbound sales is, you know, how do you close that gap? Yeah. You know, I, so I'm going to do outbound sales. This person's never heard of me. And now I'm going to tell them like, hey, here's a solution that costs five times as much as what everybody <laughs> else is trying to sell you. I'm just curious, you know, if yeah. you see that in what you're doing and, yeah. and um, all right, let's do it. You know. I'll break it down. So let's get to the genesis of sales first, right? Like a lot of folks when they think of outbound sales or sales in general, they think of Wolf of Wall Street, Grant Cardone, banging on phones, buy or die, smile and dial, whatever you want to call it, right? Mm -hmm. Sales at its core is a transaction built on trust between two entities or people. That's it. Right. And so at the end of the day, the, the core crux of that is a transaction between two people based on what trust. And so what you get with inbound is built in trust. They came to you because you already built trust through content, through uh, being good at what you do, through a referral, through a network. Outbound is different. They don't know you. You have zero trust when you start that relationship. And so the first things first is we call it the trust transaction ladder. So uh, there are stepping stones or, or if you want to call them rungs in the ladder to get to what we ultimately want, which is a transaction. And so the, the steps before that are we got to get attention. So we got to know how to get attention. Uh, the second is we've got to, we don't have to, but it's ideal to create likability, right? Likability can in increase trust. Now, what we do know is no one's going to pay a ten or $15,000 retainer because someone likes us. It's not going to happen. However, the next step is credibility. People will make a decision based on credibility. You can skip likability and go straight to credibility and you can get a deal done because you're credible. My argument is though, is if you can create likability, you're going to have far more at bats at proving credibility where the transaction is going to eventually happen based off. So back to the, the question about outbound sales. Again, it is a transaction based on trust between two people. So all outbound sales is, is how do we systematically get attention build trust through likability and credibility, and then ultimately transact. So systematically, how do we systematically get in front of someone else, right? That's the two people part. How do we build trust in a sales process, which I'll get to in a second. And then ultimately, how do we ask for the sale and the, and the transaction occurs at that point? So the next part, the hardest part is the building the trust. You get the attention, build the trust. If you get to that first time appointment in an outbound sales, you have now started what we call the, the momentum curve, right? So you either are going to, at that point, after the first time appointment, you're going to continue the relationship either in a, a smooth you know, uh, increase to a transaction or you're going to fall off after the first time appointment and have to build your way back up to the next step. So the goal there is how do we not just gain momentum, which is the attention part, but how do we keep it throughout a sales process to eventually transact with someone? And that's where value comes in. Value, entertainment, likability, credibility. How do we seed? We call it seeding throughout a sales process. Where a lot of folks fall short is follow-ups not as necessary or as hard when someone comes inbound, right? Because they've already come, they're trust, they're already pretty sure they want to work, they just got to figure it out. If you don't follow up very good, they might follow up with you. In outbound sales, you probably got to have a pretty strong follow-up game. So not only to get their attention, but you got to continue to keep their attention get them to the next meeting, get them to the next stage, get them to the proposal, whatever it is um, that your sales process, and you've got to do that and follow-up game has to be super strong. So a lot of that is one of the biggest mistakes is you have the first time appointment. If you do not set, confirm, you probably experience with JJ. I guarantee JJ sets your next meeting on the first meeting. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, of course he did because that's what I teach. And so that's one thing of keeping momentum, right? Again, the deal didn't work out, but it had a higher chance of working out because he got you to the next stage of the process 
And so a lot of people will get out the first time appointment. They might have a fantastic first time appointment, but again, they don't really know you that well. You had the, this is the one touch point they've had with you. And so if you don't set that expectation for the next step, let's just say it's a second appointment or a follow-up meeting or a proposal. If you don't set the expectation at the end of the first call that there's going to be a second call. And while you have them on the call, getting it on the calendar, literally saying, hey, hey, Travis is great. Uh, so here's what I'd like to do next. I'd like to give our team about 72 hours to put together a scope, blah, 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 blah. We'd like to do this. Um, I want to prioritize that. So I've got my calendar open. If you wouldn't mind uh, pulling yours open as well, how does next Friday at 10 o'clock or the following Monday at 3 o'clock work for you? 10 o'clock work for you, great. Hey, uh, I'm shooting over a calendar invite now. Can you just make sure that that comes through and confirm that? Awesome. Right. That little thing right there is going to be much more difficult for them to not show up at the second meeting than the first meeting. You don't need that as much in an inbound lead as you do an outbound, but an outbound, you better damn sure be, you know, that's got to be there at a minimum. And then seeding was the other thing I talked about. In between first time appointment and second meeting, they can forget about you real easy. And so what are you seeding the relationship with? Whether it be entertainment, that does happen. Whether it be credibility, so case studies, testimonials, videos, after a call, breaking down the call with a Loom video and sending it to say, hey, Travis, really enjoyed our call. Here's a couple of things I heard from you. Um, here's next steps. Excited to put, to put together this thing. Talk to you Thursday or Friday at 10 o'clock. Um, two days later, say, hey, before our call tomorrow, you know, you came to mind. Here's an article we actually wrote about this one specific thing that you had mentioned in the call, right? Those are things you've got to have in an outbound sales follow-up process that inbound, you need those things to increase conversions, but conversions will still happen just because there's trust already built there. Very long-winded answer, but that's how I would, that's one way to handle it. Makes sense. It's a good answer. I, I figured you'd have something uh, <clears throat> worth asking about on that. So uh, <laughs> that, that's it. And, and I imagine, like I said, I, I bet a lot of people probably think the same thing. Like, is there a direct correlation between inbound or outbound versus the size, the average size of a, of a signed deal? Oh, I see. Uh, yeah, no, I think actually bigger deals come from outbound. Um, I could see that. I guess more so enterprise. because it's strategic. It's, it's um, fishing with spears, not fishing with nets. Like with inbound, it's, it's a, if you think about the funnel, which we all know about top of the funnel, you got your MQLs, bottom of the funnel, you've got your deals finished and you're trying to qualify and work people down. Well, I only have what comes through my funnel to work with. Whereas in a whale hunting capacity, like for you, if you're going after big personal injury, like one of my best friends uh, in the agency space, longtime client is rankings.io CEO, Chris Dreyer. He's the best in the game when it comes to SEO for attorneys for personal injury specifically. And he's, he's got a massive agency we work them for a long time and his deals are 50,000, 100,000, $150,000 retainers, monthly retainers for SEO, just mm -hmm. SEO, right? Insane retainers. He's not going to get that. Like Dolman, one of his biggest clients is not going to come through an ad. It's not going to come through a piece of content. He's got to go get it. And so how do we you know, create a systematic process of getting in front of them, building trust and transacting with someone like a Dolman? where the real money is. And so, yes, the bigger deals, they take longer, they're more complex. You can lose them at any moment, but they're worth it when you get it. You know, can they come through inbound? Yes, I'm not saying that as a blanket statement, but overall, it's very difficult uh, to get those size, those, per, you know, premier gold standard mm -hmm. type of clients through inbound. Comparative. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I, I get it. Um, all right, let me make a little bit of money real quick. So, um, guys, we've talked about this. Um, we are launching our mastermind. At the time of recording this, we are beginning of April. We are launching at the end of April with our 20 founding members. Uh, we do officially have a name. Um, uh, you know, we didn't have it at the last podcast. We do have a name. It is the best damn agency mastermind. How's that for confidence? Uh, so we have created a mastermind for agency owners specifically who are serious about growth. We've got agencies that are as small as 500,000 um, and, and as large as eight figures. And we're all coming together as a collective who care about uh, more specifically getting growth and sales right for our agencies, right? We're not trying to build lifestyle business. We're trying to build big, successful agencies that grow predictably, sustainably, and scalably. What makes us unique is not only are we creating experiences together with other agency owners, Right, So we're going to have the accountability. We're going to have the teaching and training. I'm going to bring world-class people in to train on a monthly basis. 
but I'm also creating a sub community for your salespeople. So you're gonna have a sub community of masterminds. So as your salespeople come into your agency, whether it be now or in the future, they also get a sub community to be around other agency salespeople learning what's working today so that they can have that community themselves. It's a huge retention tool for you. Uh, it's also a huge revenue generator for you because they're learning new tricks of the trade and they're being taught by me and my team. But on top of that, how it relates to you is you also have the community with other agency owners that are, are hiring salespeople, training salespeople, managing salespeople, uh, thinking about growth at a big level. So if you are interested in checking out the best damn agency mastermind, uh, go to salesdrivenagency.com, click on book a call, talk to my team, and they will get you set. We are opening up to the first 20 members as founding members. Well, it's almost full. We got about six spots left at the time of reading this. Um, but eventually we will grow after that. The price is just going to jump substantially. So get in with that while you can. Go to salesdrivenagency.com, book a call with the team, and they will get you sorted out. I will see you on the inside. Let's get back to Travis. Oh, man. All right, man. So speaking of figuring out the future for where you guys are heading, what are some big goals that you're trying to achieve? On top of that, what do you foresee as some of the bigger options? We're talking about outbound, so we can kind of shelf that. What are some of the big obstacles for you as you look to getting to wherever it is you're trying to get to? So let's start there. Where are you trying to get to? What are the obstacles? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So on the link building side of our company, um, it's almost hit, it got to where we wanted it to get to. Um, and so it kind of almost, it, it runs on autopilot to some extent. And so it's a smooth operation, which is why we've chosen now to actually add in um, the law firm side of things, right? Add some challenge back in because mm -hmm. the other side of it, there's not so much challenge. Like people call us, they hire us, we do good job. They stay around forever. Um, and, and it repeats. It's a great business, but not so challenging. So on the law firm side of things, we're basically starting from zero. We, we had zero as of February 1st, we had zero law firm agencies as clients. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we signed up three or four of them between February and now. Um, and, and some of those were actually fairly, fairly large, larger than we had initially anticipated. So that was just a, a random good start to things. And so I imagine that the, one of the biggest challenges that we're going to face here is the logistics of building a team, because our goal is 36 months, 100 law firms, $6 million in revenue, mm. right? Annual revenue by year three. So if you do the math on that, it's basically assuming that each of the 100 Law firms pay roughly five thousand dollars per month. Um, in what we've seen from the first three, that's like three to four times lower than what it will actually be. Mm -hmm. um, but we're still shooting for the one hundred number, and so we already have the content team. We already have the link building team, but we have to build out the technical team, web developers, and the local SEO team. And so getting a team and getting that process to, to stay um, fluent and not break it and scale it up fast enough to essentially work on a hundred projects, uh, you know, within the first 36 months, that's going to be a big challenge because um, you're going to have to go back and update that process as updates happen from Google. And there's going to be a lot of people at that point that you also have to update on it, um, you know, versus link building where, there's changes to link building, but if you've been doing it the right way, there's not really that many changes in the past three, four years that really amount to anything. Mm -hmm. um, but with local SEO, with on-page SEO, there have been a number of changes that actually do have a big impact over the past you know, year even. Um, and so you, we're going to add that element in. That'll be challenging. Um, the second part, not to go back to it, outbound sales, that's going to be the biggest challenge on its own, yeah. um, but we're going to tackle that one and, and get past it. Um, I think the third challenge probably is that there are so many options. Um, and so it becomes a matter of finding the right fit of those people, right? On two extremes. I, I'm familiar with, with rankings.io. Um, they're going to be on the top tier of pricing. Yeah. Um, then you have like Justia, and that's on, I, to my understanding, one of the lower pricing ends, primarily on page stuff like that, right? So the challenge is to figure out where is this, where's the sweet spot at mm. within the market, right? Because there's only so many law firms that are going to go to the extreme top tier. Yeah. And <clears throat> there's a lot of law firms that are going to fall, fall well below anything that we want to work on. 
And so, you know, that's probably to go from, from individual tactical challenges to, to strategy wise, um, probably that's going to be the biggest challenge is figuring out the targeting to make sure that we hit those right groups of people, because we also don't want to go too far <clears throat> over, you know, say, say our range is 5,000 to 25,000 per month mm-hmm. um, for, a, for an attorney. We don't want to stack the deck right out of the gate with three, three, five, seven, ten major law firms because they're going to eat up a lot of time. Yeah, for sure. And you're not going to be able to scale. And then what happens? You get into this cycle where one or two of them leave. You're way over staff now. You're losing money. Typically, Those things aren't great. So we want to find the right people that they're going to fit into that range so that we can also hit the right scale so that we don't run into an issue. Uh, and that's something we learned from previously, right? Like in, in 2014, 2015, um, a lot of our whole agency was propped up by a few big, big clients. And so, you know, the thought of like, oh, what if they leave? We'll be, this will be a huge mess. Um, you don't want to do that. And so I think that, you know, probably for a lot of agencies, you have to avoid the the desire to just like, I'm going to land this one mega client and I'm going to stake my whole life on this thing because they're one switch away from, from wrecking it. And yeah. so that's, that's really it is, I think, finding that spot in between so that we can hit the scale we want. Right. But, you know, and, and so. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's a huge takeaway for those who are listening. I mean, I think we do. So I'm a big fan of whale hunting, right? I love the bigger deals. And, and bigger deals matter more the less you get them, right? So, like, at first they become whale clients and then you do them enough, they just become clients' clients, right? They're just – they are who you go after. But he's right. Like, you don't want to front load your entire business or base your business off of, of one client, right? Like, 10% of your revenue or more, you're already working in some dangerous territories because agencies – I mean, you we get this dilemma where – the sweet spot is we operate at like an 80%, 90% capacity. And then if we go land a big client, we're now operating at 110, 120. So then we hire, right? And then we get back down to the 80 or 90 sweet spot. And then we lose a whale. And now we're operating at 65% capacity and we're way over bloated on expenses. And so we crush our profit margin. How do we continue to work that sweet spot? And, and, And it goes back to being able to drive predictable revenue. If you can drive predictable revenue, that becomes less risky for you. So I think one beautiful thing about what you guys have done is just been able to consistently, at least on a link building side, drive leads over and over and over and over again. And I would imagine your inbound sales process is probably fairly dialed in at this point or decent. Um, if you can do that, then taking on those big clients becomes a little less risky. Or just go yeah. a bunch of big clients and it becomes less risky there. Keep them under 10% is my takeaway there. 10% of your overall yeah. Yeah, I'm with you. That's the big thing is that we just want to make sure, and and that's something we really focus on now. And we didn't know to not do that in the beginning. It's like, you know, you're sitting there and all of a sudden you're like, wait a second, who's that that's on the other side of the phone? Yeah, no, we're definitely going to win this project. This is it. Yeah. And then you're like, oh man, what if they go somewhere? And so, um, you know, at the time looking back, we probably shouldn't have taken on that project because it did skew us heavily towards focusing our resources on execution of that project versus on, you know, growth. And I'd say it probably slowed down our progress for a year or two. Um, you know, and that's, that's something that now we want to make sure that, uh, you just don't get disproportionately resource heavy on any one client. Um, you know, if you do go after well clients, then you should be able to get to your target number of, um, uh, whatever. But, you know, we, I don't think that within 36 months, um, uh, we're going to be at the point where we want a hundred law firms that, that spend a hundred thousand dollars a month with us, sure. um, because that's going to be a lot of scaling and there's going to be a lot of brand new people in the process. Yeah. And I think their quality control issues would definitely come up in that scenario. And so sure. that's kind of why we're limiting it. Cause we want to make sure that, we keep a tight handle on what comes out of the other end um, because at the end of the day, that's been one of the biggest growth uh, avenues for our agency is that we retain people for multiple years. Mm-hmm. Um, and so everything else that we've learned along the way, the bumps, the mistakes, the lost sales time, all that stuff, a lot of that's been cured or at least, um, you know, band-aided over by um, retaining the clients that we did have. Yeah. And so that's, that's something we want to make sure that we keep a tight handle on. And, and that's why I say, you know, I think it'll be a challenge to make sure that we are hitting what we want, but also 
not going too far over, which, you know, I imagine a lot of people think like, well, that sounds like a made up problem that you're getting too many <laughs> clients to spend too much money, but I can tell you very real, it did, right? Yeah, and and problem. we experienced that. Yep. It's a problem. All right, man, I want to get you out of here on what we call the round of random. So a round of random is five, ran- well, technically six random questions that I ask every guest, uh, ranging from personal things to business things. So my man, are you ready for the round of random? Lay it on me. Let's rock and roll. All right. First one applicable. Since I see it in your background, if you're watching this, there's some booze in the background. What is your drink of choice? Favorite drink, lime margaritas. Favorite alcohol, tequila. What kind I of like tequila? tequila? You have like a preference on brand on on the on the uh, on the makers or what's your go to? Yeah, so I really like the the different craft tequilas, like a lot of no name ones. Uh, when we go on vacation in Mexico, things like that, like Puerto Vallarta, mm-hmm. uh, there's a lot of places there that actually make it locally. You've never heard of them. A night and day difference from like what you think of like Don Julio, something like that is, sure. is like in America, good tequila. But uh, definitely like the little local craft ones are always my, my favorite go-to. Uh, coffee tequila being my favorite of all those. Really? Coffee flavored tequila. Yeah. Nice. It's pretty I've awesome. I've never tried that. I'll take you to go. Yeah, we have a massive in, in Knoxville. If you ever come this way on uh, on 40, you'll uh, you'll get an opportunity. I'll take you over to Chivo Taqueria, which is like a massive tequila selection. Very good. Very solid. That's where I first tried uh, Clase Azul uh, Añejo. My fa- well, second favorite tequila. Incredible. All right. That's the first one. Second one, if you could have dinner with anyone in the world, living or dead, who would you choose and why? I, I tell you, probably uh, Mr. Wonderful from Shark Tank. Okay. I think that would be a, a great one to have. Um, and I just like how he always defaults to thinking of uh, how can I scale this and, and then, you know, perpetuity. That's his big thing. What can I do to basically get hands-free growth? Yep. Uh, that's that's probably, that would be the one I think would be full of, of golden nuggets to have that conversation. That's that infinite return on investment there. All right, third, very easy. Uh, physical book or audio book? What's your preference? Audio book. Yeah, of course. What's what's the last thing you listened to? I tell you, it's been a while since I listened to anything. <laughs> You're not uh, traveling as much, I, I'm sure. I'm not that. I'm, I'm not one of those people who's like, oh, you got to read three business books every single day to learn stuff. Um, I did in the beginning, yep. and then I to switched point where it's just to, like, I just need to go execute on this shit. Yeah, I'm just going to test it out and see what happens because like 70% of what you read in books is bullshit, all yeah. of it, you know. And Thank so I'm like, no thanks, I'm going to pass I just, that. I wish my guests cussed more on my podcast. I'm the only one who cusses usually. It's like, come on, guys. I know you yeah. want to. <laughs> I do I do sometimes. Audio. I was in so, the right. army. So you wouldn't even know the last one. That's fair. I, I'm, I'm kind of the same, same boat. I'm one of those guys who I just don't uh, – consumption mm-hmm. is not as important as execution, so – I kind of made a rule for myself a long time ago. If I read a book, I've got to pick one thing to apply from it. It doesn't have to stick there, but I got to at least try it. I got to test it out, see if it works. Yeah. And that made me read a lot less books because then I got my to do list got too long. <laughs> yeah. I, I much prefer like specific training over books. Like, yeah. teach me how to do something, teach me the process more so of yeah. how something works and then turn me loose so I can go and try that out and see what happens. I like that. Um, and people should go buy my Fire Yourself Academy. On that note, uh, how to hire, train, and manage salespeople. All right. If you could start any other business other than an agency, what business would you start and why? Uh, I'd probably start something in the automotive space. I'm a big really? car guy. I like cars. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what it would be. Probably like a performance shop, something like that. Love um, it. More of a hobby so than a than a bit. I'm sure it would make money because you really can't not make money when you start building high-end cars. But uh, yeah. that's probably the way I would go. What's, um, if you could have any car right now, what would it be? Uh, so right now, I actually have a Ferrari California T. That's a lot of nice. fun. Um, bought that one because it has a small back seat. So I have two kids and they like to ride around in the back of it. Yeah. The other ones don't have the back seat. Nice. Um, yeah, so that's it. Looked at a bunch of other ones. We had a lot of really cool ones. Before that, I had a G-Wagon. That's that's awesome. That's Big badass. clanky. It's like a tank. It is. Uh, have you heard yeah. of the Resvani Motors? No, what's it? Dude, look up Resvani Motors Tank Military Edition. It's like 300000 starting price. It's insane. 
is it that I think I know what you're talking about? It, it, yeah. I think I don't know about that got, one, but I've seen a, I think it's like got it. one thousand, maybe eleven hundred, but it's at least a thousand horsepower, and it's basically like a Jeep style, but with a tank attached, basically bolted on. It's badass. Yeah, yeah I'm looking at Audi, an Audi R8 right now. Um, I'm not huge into cars. I actually like F150, so I drive a nice F150, yeah. but. I've gotten more into some supercars lately. We'll see. Yeah. You hang well, that's our, that's, we call it our clunker. Right. We, we have a Lincoln Navigator, yeah. uh, the new Lincoln Navigator. That's, that's what we beat around town in. Um, but yeah, yeah, no, I, cars are fun. Love Fast it. Fast cars. Yeah. Don't hang out with rich people. Then you start having expensive taste and when you never did in the first place. That's what I learned. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right. Most of us have that one or two things in our lives that we are irrationally passionate about. Yours could be cars, but if you have another answer, it'd be great. Some people sports, other people it might be Star Wars. What are you irrationally passionate about other than cars? So this sounds fake, but I'm telling you, it's not business stuff. Yeah, I actually really enjoy it. Specifically, making up stuff that seems really impossible to do and then doing it. Um, I really, on a personal level, enjoy that. Like, if I'm going to be working on nights or weekends or whatever, it's because I'm trying to do something that I'm like, well, this, I can't do this. Um, and it almost happened by chance, right? Like, I started an agency, no clue what I was doing. Um, and so, since then, I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to make up some goal and then I'm just going to go and do it. Love it. Insert, you know, the law firm SEO thing. So, <laughs> cheesiness aside, it's it's just a legitimately something I, I have a lot of fun with. True entrepreneurs, it is an obsession. So I'm in the same boat. All right, man. Last question. Where can people find out more about you, uh, more about Stellar, whatever it is you want to plug? This is your chance. Yep. So just go to stellarseo.com, check out the blog. There's two things in there. Uh, One's the definitive guide to link building. So if you don't know what you're doing, just read it. It's 12, 13,000 words, but it's like step by step directions. I wrote it myself. Um, so if you if you follow it and you can't build links, then maybe try something different than link building. Um, <laughs> second one is a law firm SEO guide. Follows much the same format. Um, it's not so much geared towards agencies as if you're like a marketing director right. at a at a law firm. But um, basically, the blog, social media, we don't do so much on. Um, but we'll probably change that in the future. But for now, go to the website, check out the stuff. If you like it, call us. If not, you know, do something with Pick it. Rocks. Just don't read it and do nothing. There you go. Love it. Cool, man. Well, hey, man, I appreciate you coming on. Grateful for your time. Thank you for your wisdom and and sharing your journey with us. I know that people will find that valuable. Um, Until next time.